Ernst, welcome. Thank you. Um, social housing, housing the social. We start with a nice general question. Um, considering this title, uh, how can you, how would you contextualize this title? What, what does that sort of, what does it mean to you? And how, what's your position in this? Well, first of all, to me as a, as a Dutch citizen who's grown up in, uh, in the Netherlands and who's, who's done his studies in Amsterdam, it means an increasingly dwindling uh, amount of space available to people with lower incomes. Mm, you can see that in the Netherlands, not only that social housing is sort of under pressure, the idea of social housing, but more importantly, you can also see that well, the idea of the necessity of housing the social in a broader sense is under attack now. I actively feel this, uh, feel this attack. And I've conceptualized it myself as a status quo so to speak, a normal way of doing things that is increasingly disallowing the social to be housed. It's quite a provocative political statement, but I've experienced that, for instance, in the practice of squatting, where uh, uh, during my student times I've uh, uh, gotten involved with the squatting movement, who, in my opinion, uh, rightfully uses abandoned space in a crowded housing market. So you have the situation in the streets, the shopping streets in Amsterdam are a good example for this. You have to wait six to seven years if you're a student for, uh, for, uh, for affordable living space. But all the spaces above the shops in Amsterdam are empty. And the reason why they are empty is because the shops that are located, for instance, in the Kalverstraat, they prefer to have larger window space. Right? If you have to, uh, want to make a door so that people can go into the, to the higher, uh, higher floors, then you lose some window space. And this whole Kalverstraat, on the bottom, you have these fancy stores with large windows. And above that, there is space that could house hundreds of people that is rotting away. Now, the squatting movement has uh, done so for a long time, ever since the 60s already. They said, well, if we have to wait for seven years and there's all the space rotting away, why don't we use it in the meantime? Why don't we use the space before it's being claimed? And before it's in the, in the, in the interstices between that it's used? And, of course, squatting has been outlawed. October last year has seen the pass of the squatting ban. And one of the ways in which the squatting ban is legitimized is by an appeal to uh, personal private property. Right? You don't touch someone's property. That's important nowadays. And you can see that, that increasingly that's become the, social, the status quo to uh, prefer private property over social dimensions of society. And housing is one very important aspect of that. You mentioned earlier it's under attack. Where is that attack uh, coming from, according to you? Well, the easy answer would be uh, uh, certain privatization, certain ideas of, of uh, for instance, of uh, uh, the privatization of the housing market, certain ideas of, well, you could say really the behavior of uh, housing agencies, the behavior of politicians. But what I think, <coughs> what I think is even more important is this idea of the status quo. It's under attack increasingly from an idea that is so-called self-evident. It's self-evident not to squat anymore. You can see that I've done some uh, spokesmanships for the squatting collective that I'm active for. And over the last seven years, I've noticed it's become increasingly difficult to speak about squatting, to speak about the act of appropriating uh, and dilapidated space. Right? You see, you are confronted with looks of disbelief. You are confronted with the majority of the population it doesn't quite understand what's going on. Right, so the more important than voting for left or right, voting for whatever, or more important than resisting certain laws, is the struggle for the status quo. And is struggling, uh, the struggle, in my opinion, amounts to basically opening up the status quo, confusing the status quo, doing something which somehow falls outside of the status quo, and therefore enabling a new fundamental reflection to be had. So, for instance, in my experience, squatting as a term doesn't function anymore. Right? It's not the political uh, uh, drive. It doesn't have the political drive anymore that it used to have. And we need to actively take a look for new terms and new practices that can disrupt the status quo. And this, there's an intimate link, in my opinion, between this disruption of the status quo and the housing of the social. Because this link basically implies if we don't criticize the status quo, if we don't look critically at the people and the practices that we are marginalizing, we tend to forget what is most important, the people that are marginalized, the people that lie outside of the status quo, the people that display behavior that we think is, you know, runs counter to the status quo and that they're therefore crazy. So I really think that there's an active need to open up the status quo in order to rethink you know, social housing. And uh, according to you, how, what do you see the role of 
the artistic producer, whether it be a curator or an artist or a cultural worker, mm -hmm. uh, in this, in this opening up. Yeah, what well kind of position can he or she take? There's a really interesting thing going on in Amsterdam at the moment, which is Occupy Amsterdam. And that's a movement that has uh, gotten, well, great fame uh, ever since uh, they started occupying Wall Street, but it has its roots in the uh, Arab Spring as well. And there you see a, a quite a political movement, people saying we are the 99%, we don't want uh, this financial system to you know, uh, be responsible for well, our social decline. And in that very political uh, uh, action, very political camp, you have a community of artists, they're called artists, and they call themselves artists in Occupy. And what they're doing there is basically zooming in on what I think is an intimate connection between politics and art, which is basically thinking about new things, thinking about things in new way, ways, trying to give images, trying to give words, trying to give body, basically, to that which is unforeseen, to that which might be hidden, to, uh, to that which might, well, confuse, disrupt, to that which might generate stares of disbelief and might generate criticism, but is nonetheless important to stand, stand for and do. And, and how does this uh, relate or hold water up against what you mentioned earlier, this moral and social financial disinvestment uh, in, in the, the idea of, of the social. Yeah, well clearly you can see that w what uh, uh, the housing market and, the, and, the, and the, uh, the sphere of arts have in common is that increasingly there's a sort of market reasoning being applied. Increasingly it's become difficult to uh, explain the value of art but also of social practices in ways that are not monetary, in ways that are not financial. There's a very intimate connection there and what I think is important and what I think is, is uh, is uh, very exciting to see is that increasingly people are resisting the urge, artists are resisting the urge to say, all right, I'm just going to sell my work to such an extent that I get still get subsidy. I'm going to try to, you know, phrase and frame my practices so that I might escape the next, ra next round of budget cuts. And increasingly people are seeing, no, this is a shared struggle, right, that my budget is being cut. That means that there is a larger problem in society. It's not just my personal bank account problem but it's a problem that art as such becomes, well, difficult to speak of in terms other than money. So increasingly you see that in art people are starting to realize this political potential of disrupting this, well, market logic that is, mm, well, gaining strength, but as it's gaining strength, it's also gaining in opposition. So there, there's a collaborative, collaborative potential in this. How far is the, is the breadth of that? How far can that potential go? as well, far as you're concerned, both in terms of sectors, uh, in, mm -hmm. in, in terms of other players, as well as amongst artists and, and cultural practitioners? Well, we'll see, right? And uh, how far that will go, we'll have to see. What I think is very important is that, and you can see that, that this disruption of the status quo that I was talking about, right? The moment you start doing that, the first question people ask is, well, but what do you want? What is your end goal? What is your vision of society? How do you want things to, to become? If you don't like the way we're, we're you know, handling this economic crisis, then what is your detailed financial plan to solve this? And this idea that in order to resist this, in order to forge alliances, you have to have a detailed program that extends into the, into the, the, the next future and the next social democracy. This idea should be resisted. It, for the moment, I think there's a great force in just standing somewhere on a square in Amsterdam, say in an occupied square in Amsterdam, and saying this is a disruption of the status quo. Where it's going to lead, I don't know. This is a work of art. This is not a valuable object in terms of money. This is a work of art. What it means, I don't know. But if we start with this disruption, if we start with this idea that it's innegotiable that this object or this practice should be seen solely in terms of financial gain or financial value or any other applied value in society, if you just start with emphasizing that, that it's irreductible, that you can't reduce it to that, then you have a starting point for change. And where that's going to go, I don't know. We'll see, for instance, in the case of the, of the artistic practice, right? What you can see is that increasingly people are realizing, all right, we, know where, we don't know where it's going to lead, but it's not going to lead to more of the same, right? With the social uh, resistance movements that are growing now. You see, all right, we don't know where it's going to go, but we know what we don't want. And back to the, the, the notion of social housing, mm -hmm. there, is an, there is a marginalized uh, people who, who are becoming larger, the group considerably. Mm -hmm. uh, the gap is becoming wider between them and, uh, and a, a 
a very relatively small, distinct few. Mm -hmm. What do uh, what do this marginalized majority need? What do they require in in the situation of social housing? Do you, do you have a, an indication of that, and perhaps your own position uh, in that yeah. as a academic, but uh, as a, as an activist as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's. Uh on all fronts, there's a sort of tension rising. Yeah, but what I think is is needed first and foremost is visibility. I think that visibility is a is a very undervalued uh, undervalued term here. Uh, if if you can just somehow say we are here, right? One of the slogans of the Occupy movement is we are the 99 percent, right? It doesn't even say right who yeah, these 99 percent exactly are, nor does it say what they what they exactly want. But what it says is we are here. We are 99%, the 1% that owns the vast majority of financial, financial means is not representing us. Right? We are not represented. It's, a, it's really, I see our current situation as a crisis in representation as well. People are fed up with having to vote once every four years for flavors of exactly the same status quo. Right? People are feeling actively the need to some sort of disruption of that. If you can give that visibility, you have a new starting point. Uh, my role in that is, and uh, what I like to do, what I'm, what I'm and, and, and passionate about, is to continue this train of thought, to take a look at beginning points, to see how they can be extended without folding this beginning point back in the already existing status quo. And it, in order to do that, it takes thought, it takes deep thought, because um, as with status quo, uh, as it happens with status quo, it's very easy to fall back into them. Right? So it takes deep thought. What is it? in a work of art that reduces, that, that makes it irreductible to, to financial value. What is that? That requires deep thought. And what does it have in common with a social activist that says, look at these practices, look at these people who claim uh, uh, their right to representation. What does it mean that they are here? What are the implications of that? And they might run very deep. They might run very deep. For instance, the crisis of representation, right? That increasingly people feel that the ways in which you can talk about things, the ways in which you can express your political opinions, doesn't suffice anymore. That might mean that a whole new way of thinking about presence, a whole new way of thinking about well, political presence, artistic presence, is needed. And that's a project that I would uh, uh, like to embark on. This also leads to a, a new consideration of responsibility. Mm. How, do you, how do you see that? And, and perhaps also the position of uh, the artist, the academic, the activist in, in this, hmm. where that new responsibility may lie, where it must lie? Yeah, well, I think society has a lot to learn from artists. Right? I think especially this political juncture in which we're at now has a lot to learn from artists. And why? Because one could see the artist as the experts par excellence of non-representation. Right? You can see artists as being completely specialized in not being well, advertisers, not being illustrators to a prefixed point, but in taking somehow the capacity to represent, in taking somehow the capacity to generate meaning and lead it to unknown territories. Uh, artists are, are, are experts in this, and it's time we should learn from them. And uh, you can already see that happening. That, for instance, what do you put on a banner, right? What do you, uh, how do you represent yourself if representation as such is that which you are trying to criticize? There's an intimate connection here with artists and uh, well, responsibility. I wouldn't know because I think everybody is free to make their own, their, uh, free to make their own, their, their own choices. But there is a potential for learning from artists in the sense that if you want to criticize regimes of representation, well, artists are your conversation partner. That that brings us to the symposium itself. Uh, you're a moderator of one of the sessions. Yeah. Um, what do you think this symposium may offer? Uh, what can it bring? And more importantly, who should be at the table? You know, who should be here uh, hearing this and, and taking part in this discussion? Yeah, well, I think everybody should hear this and everybody should take part in the discussion. This sounds hopeful, this sounds uh, idealistic. Nonetheless, I think it's a goal to strive for. You should do something which appeals to a large amount of uh, uh, people as possible. And as far as what I expect of the, of the symposium, what I would really like is, and what I'm trying to do in my session, is I'm trying to compare different forms of housing the social in conflict, I've called it. It means that I want to bring people uh, around the table that somehow bring their well, prefixed ways of representation into crisis, that focus on, the moment, on this moment of crisis. For instance, uh, a techno, one of the topics that we will discuss is techno music. 
the most abstract, repeti repetitive, uh, drug-filled, uh, nihilistic music you can imagine. Right? But if you take a look at the origins of uh, Detroit techno music, if you take a look at their origins in abandoned factory buildings, where people precisely enjoy their own alienation, where people precisely use repetitive, uh, uh, alienating music and appropriate it, enjoy it, make a party out of it, then you've got a surprising way in which the social can be housed. Right? If you take a look at, at uh, these artists that somehow feel aligned with this Occupy movement, then you see there, you see that in the artistic practice there might be a surprising way in which the social can be housed. And what is that way? And, 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 and that is precisely the rupture of the status quo, where people all in their own fields, artists are doing it, and, DJ, and Detroit techno DJs are doing it, squatters used to do it, and they're still trying to struggle to find ways to do it. Right? Uh, the general population feels unrest, feels uh, the need for new forms of representation. If we can connect these people somehow, if we can connect, well, what can we learn from Detroit techno music if we see it as a social experiment? What can we learn from the Occupy movement? What can we learn from artists? What are the comparisons? What are the similarities between these struggles? Then we can somehow, I think, at some point, try to see similarities, try to see solutions even, and try to learn, for instance, activists can learn from artists. If you don't want to be represented easily, if you don't want to be, fall into the pitfalls of a prefixed identity, make an artist, uh, have an artist make your banner. Well, if we can talk about that during the symposium, those sort of uh, interminglings, uh, interminglings and those sort of, well, uh, cross-feeding of each other, then the symposium is a, is a great success. Okay.